Hello, hello, humans. So, we're just over a week into Fire Emblem Engage, and as first playthroughs start to kind of wind down, I've been thinking about some things I wish I would have done differently if I was able to use the Time Crystal IRL and fix my playthrough from the start. And what I came up with are six little points that I think would be pretty helpful even if you're in the late game right now you can still make use of these and you can just take them as some lessons learned and some facts that you may not know about. And I'm definitely going to be making use of these in my next playthroughs and uh, you should too. So here's a video that's going to be pretty much spoiler free other than some very minor things such as character that are recruitable that everyone already knows about because Twitter. Also, if you can, leave a like and comment on the video. I know it doesn't seem like much, but it really does help out the channel a lot. And if you like what I do and want to subscribe for more engaged content, that would be cool too because I've got a ton more videos coming. By the way, I do read all my comments, so if there's anything I missed that you wish I had put in this video that you want to let me know about, feel free to let me know below. Now, without further ado, let's get right into it. Number one, use Yunaka. One of the most underrated early and mid-game units in Engage is Yunaka. And I say underrated even though I know she's highly acknowledged online because I cannot drive home how good she really is. You get her relatively early on, and since she's a covert unit, she gets double the avoid bonuses when she's in terrain that allows you to dodge. My Yunaka ended up getting pretty strength screwed in the late game, so I got diminishing returns on her, but another fun fact is that daggers are some of the best weapons to forge since their might increases by two pretty much every level. This will boost up even strength screwed Yunakas if you're able to get a silver dagger plus five for example, which is honestly one of the best weapons to forge up to in general. If you're in the early game, even something like an iron or steel dagger can pack a huge punch at plus five, and most maps have dodge terrain on them, so you'll be able to make use of this combo. A bit of a pro tip for the late game, and I'm not considering this a spoiler because everyone knows who the emblem rings are at this point, but I've gotten a lot of use out of pairing Yunaka with Corrin. Corrin's emblem ring changes its dragon vein ability based on the movement type of the unit, and with covert units it generates a 3x3 avoid fog that also impedes unit movement if they're on forest tiles, that's including both you and enemies. This not only immediately activates Yunaka's personal skill which increases crit by 15% when she is on this type of terrain, but it also makes her pretty much impossible to hit. So yeah, tip number one, use Yunaka. She's a fantastic early game unit, has great weapon options and range, and has a very viable usage through the late game with a nice bond ring pairing. Number two, use the forge. I really wanted to make a Star Wars joke and say use the force Luke, but honestly that's kind of tired and I made it anyways and oh my god why am I doing this? But anyways, a super early game tip in order to get those nicely forged powerful weapons is to, well, use the forge. I recently made a video on this, so there should be a link in the top right corner of your screen right about now if you haven't seen it already. However, for the sake of putting this in the video, because I really can't hammer this home enough, make sure your farm area is only populated by dogs. If you want to play this game casually and just put, ever, put whatever animals you want in the farm area, that's fine. But for some reason, Intelligent Systems decided to make a farm feature, and the most important things you get from it are metals, aside from cooking ingredients, which is what you get from every other animal except dogs. I mean, I guess it makes sense, you farm and you get animal products to cook. But anyways, if you put dogs in the farm, they bring in ingots, which are your forging materials. And there is a not very low chance of you being able to get silver ingots from it after every single battle you do. Yes, this also includes skirmishes and paralogs. Heck, even very recently, I got a full five silver ingots, which is massive for my forging, and it'll really help you get a head start on making your weapons very powerful. In my last video, some people were asking for what my forge recommendations were, and I think some of the best weapons to forge early on that will stay with you until the late game are killer weapons to plus four, because it's pretty cheap, Thunder to plus five, and I'll go into the reason why in the next point, and daggers, because they get such a massive boost. Outside of that, silver weapons are a great investment, even if you just do them to plus one because of the massive might bonus that they give. And last but not least, if you want to get to higher tier weapons and use the forge to do that, again, you can check my video if you want to know what those weapons are and how to get to them, that's also not a bad idea early game. Number three, don't waste your bond points on the stupid gacha. Look, I know you Fire Emblem Heroes addicts can't stop yourselves from dumping the seemingly unimportant bond points into the gacha every time you get a hundred of them, but for the love of god, I'm going to need you to contain yourselves a little bit because it's an absolute waste. 
There is currently a bit of an exploit for bond point summoning that will save you a ton of bond points, and I won't harp on it too long because there's a great video by Choops that will help you get exactly what you need and tell you how to do it, and I'll leave a link to it in the description below. What I will say is that there are a few bond rings that are really good, such as the Olwen ring that lets you double attack if you have a Thunder Tome equipped. And that's exactly why I said the Thunder plus 5 Tome is a good one to forge before, and it's extremely helpful and will carry you through the game regardless of which mage you use it on, and it'll be viable all the way into the late game. A lot of people like Citrin for this though, because she has an extremely high magic growth and will do a lot of damage, and you can also immediately promote her in the chapter you get her in. Another point I want to talk about here is the fact that you can use your bond points to level up your bond ring level in the training area in the Somnial. When you level up your bond rings, the amount of stats that they give you increases. So if you really want to use a certain bond ring on a certain character that you've gotten a little bit later and you want to catch them up and have them get that stat boost, you can spend your bond points on that. And the further you get into the levels, the more expensive it gets. So it is worth saving some of those bond points. Another reason, and this is kind of the real recommendation of why I'm talking about this point, is to get everyone to Sigurd Bond Ring 5. It only costs 500 bond points to get him to 5 and unlock skill inheritance, and that will let you inherit Cantor on everyone, which gives you 2 movement after you perform an action. It costs 1000 SP, which might be a little bit steep early on in the game, but trust me, if you can get this on your important units early, it'll help you a lot in the mid and late game. As someone who didn't do this, I'm really enjoying it now in the late game that I've kind of discovered it and started doing it on everyone, and it has opened the door for a lot of very nice combos and formations. Number 4. Promote every unit as soon as you possibly can. I'm not sure if Engage has changed the formula on this, but I feel like this is the first time it's been done in the series. In Engage, every unit has an internal counter on their total level. For example, an Alir that has reached level 20 and promoted counts as having had 21 total levels and receives XP scaling to that. A Louis that promoted at level 16 and is now level 5 is also counted as having 21 total levels, and so he and Alir will receive the same amount of EXP from encounters. Also, every advanced class in this game has better growths than the base class, so there's absolutely zero downside to promoting units as soon as you can, and it'll make your life a little bit easier as they get some permanent boosts to stats, get some extra build, and movement, as well as access to advanced class skills earlier. And I know what you're thinking, what about losing those 10 levels once I hit the cap at 20 on my advanced class? Well, don't worry about that. In this game, we have second seals, and once you hit level 20, you can use that second seal to reset your level right back down to 1, or go into another class if you want, uh, and it can do that into the advanced classes as well, and it'll let you loop around again and again. There is a very healthy supply of second seals in the game, and you can even buy them from the shop, so honestly, by the time you hit that level 20 cap, you won't have that issue. So don't hesitate to promote your units, just go ahead and do it. Number 5, use your staff units. Honestly, one of the biggest mistakes I made early in the game was to very quickly drop my staff units. I found them to take up space that I didn't have and that I would have rather used a combat unit in and I felt like having their healing utility was just so easily replaceable with vulneraries, an invincible tank, or you know, just not getting hit. But the further I got through the game, the more lethal the bosses and enemy units have gotten and I found myself thinking, man, if only that boss was broken and couldn't counterattack, or if only that boss would just stay put for one more turn. Or, if only I could choke point here or delay the enemy by a little bit. Well, staff units have the answer to all these problems. You get the obstruct staff fairly early on in the game, and what it does is create a breakable wall a short distance away from where you are, and you can select where you put it. These can have two functions. It'll either help you create a choke point, or a barrier to protect you, or you can use it as bait to make an enemy waste their turn breaking it instead of attacking. The Freeze Staff is another extremely useful utility staff. It basically locks an enemy into space for a turn and doesn't allow them to move. I found this very useful against strong enemy bosses who are often surrounded by a lot of generic units that combo well with them to cause some real problems. Using the Freeze Staff let me clean up the generics and then focus down the boss on the following turn. There is also the Fracture Staff, which has gotten a little bit later, about halfway through the game, and that instantly breaks any enemy. This is definitely a little bit more situational, but I definitely found a few times where I really wanted to attack with a certain unit without getting countered, and it came in handy. And of course, Warp and Rescue are a thing too in this game, and we all know how useful those staves are, so it goes without question. Make sure you have a staff unit or two in your team for their nice support capability, and when in doubt, they can also just function as healers or mages to kill high defense units. It's a win-win scenario. Number 6. Last but not least, for the love of god, do not invest in your regions. Seriously, the gold income in this game is absolute garbage, and I know everyone will see the regions and want to invest in them, and I'll just flat out tell you right now, it is not worth it. 
The only region that is even worth thinking about investing to is Brodia, and that's because it'll boost the amount of ingots you get from post-battle maps exponentially based on how much you invest in it. Without getting too deep into it, you get weapons and boosted exploration rewards from each level increase into a region. However, the only weapon really worth getting from these are the legendary weapons you get at level 5, and level 5 alone costs 50,000 gold to get to. So, yeah. Just ignore it. I would instead boost each region to level 2 to allow you to recruit dogs to the farm so that you can farm ingots that way, and maybe Brodia to level 3 or 4 for the 5 times and 7 times increase to ingots in the exploration in that region only. Keep in mind, this is only from skirmishes or paralogs in that region, so if you want to skip this altogether and just keep your money for forging, power to you, I can't even fault you there. I'm someone who does not do skirmishes and only does paralogs. So for me, it's like it wasn't really worth it for this increase and I feel like I wasted my money. Anyways, I think this video is getting long enough as it is for now and I have a lot of other stuff I want to talk about in separate videos in great detail because the gameplay in Engage is very deep and very diverse and I'm enjoying it so much. So stay tuned for the next coming videos and I'll see you in the next one very soon. Peace.